Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our event today, where we're going to talk about how we can improve access to surgery, including pediatric surgery in resource poor settings across the globe, and look into examples of South-South collaboration models to reach this goal. Um, I'm Jenny Ravelo, Global Health Reporter for DevEx, and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, this event is being hosted by DevEx together with our partner, the United Surgeons for Children. Um, the United Surgeons for Children, or USFC, is part of the French NGO Le Chant de l'Espoir. Um, and I want to remind everyone that um, you can send questions during this event to our Q&A box. Um, and for those on social media and tuning in, please help us build, build on the discussions that we're having today um, by sharing you know, quotes from the event or uh, your thoughts on social. Um, you can follow the conversation through the hashtag DevEx event, hashtag pediatric surgery, hashtag United Surgeons for Children. And you can use them as well in your, in your social posts. Um, we will send all participants um, a recording of the event, but I also want to let you know that you have a unique opportunity to be to virtually meet and greet with the speakers and our partner today right after our panel discussion. So please do stick around and join us for, th for that session. Um, the URL is dvx.cm slash usfc. I repeat, that's dvx.cm slash usfc. And I will be announcing the link to the session as well uh, right after our panel discussion. And um, you can also see that in the chat box where I or my colleagues will be posting it. Right, so now on to the topic. Um, you know, COVID-19 has really appended our lives as we know it. Um, and you all very well know by now that it's caused huge disruptions um, in healthcare across the globe. A lot of vaccination campaigns were suspended in 2020. Um, people who needed access to, health, to critical care are not able to in most parts of the world. Um, you know, health facilities and healthcare personnel um, have been tasked and overburdened with cases of COVID-19. And it's so heartbreaking just to read the news about people needing critical care and, and dying because because the nearest hospital could no longer accommodate them. There are no ICU beds available. Doctors and nurses have been infected as well with COVID and some of them with loss of these disease. Um, against that backdrop, you can only imagine how challenging it must be to access um, surgical care during this pandemic. Surgical cases didn't stop just because we have COVID-19. And so, you know, the Lancet Commission um, estimated that um, there were there are close to 5 billion people that lack access to surgery before this pandemic. And we can, and we can all assume that's, that's just gone up. So, um, but we do have experts, um, doctors in our panel, panel today who've been involved in surgical care in a lot of resource poor settings, involved in building local capacity of local doctors, of healthcare workers uh, to, improve, to improve access to surgery, even prior to this pandemic. And they're more, they more knowledgeable than I am uh, what's going on in this area. So I'd like to, you know, just to start, I'd like to um, introduce one of them, Dr. Dominic Yan, Division Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in New York. He's also Professor of Surgery at Montefiore Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Yan is a member of numerous leading international professional societies and has been supporting the work of La Chambre de l'Espoir for, for decades. Um, Dominic, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, everybody. So um, from New York, so for me, it would be good morning, but for the people uh, around the world, it could be probably good afternoon and uh, good evening. I'm very happy to join this uh, meeting and this uh, panel discussion to speak about uh, the impact of, uh, I would say, surgical education, surgical care, and uh, now uh, we have some burden related to the COVID-19. Obviously, I'm based in New York, and we were we got a big hit during the last spring with the COVID-19, but uh, with a very strong system uh, organiz and organization, we handled the situation pretty well beside the fact that we lost a lot of lives, but uh, we did very well. At the end of this uh, first wave, we understood that 20% uh, of the business in a hospital went down for 20%. That means that uh, 
we have seen in surgery 20 less 20 percent less surgical procedure over the year why people they did not get access to surgery probably so but uh, people also refuse to come to the hospital they prefer to postpone which could expose to major complications anyway we try to handle the situation to reinforce that now hospital we are very lucky because we're in the high income countries can handle the situation very well and with the vaccine we hope that uh, we will very soon see the end of the tunnel now i would like to discuss a little bit about pediatric surgery as i agree with you approximately 5 billion people lack access to surgical care. And nine of these people are living in a low income or middle income countries. And they, the lack of surgical access also for basic surgery. And of course, for many years, we we're trying how to fix infectious disease, but now we understand that uh, we have to uh, go to amenable surgical care to these countries. And non-communicable disease, I mean, non-infectious disease, not transmissible disease, claim to be, uh, claim more lives than infectious disease around the world. So surgery is a necessity. We is part of the global health care. And since 2015, we made tremendous progress with the World Bank, with the Commission of Global Health Surgery, and also uh, the World Health Association, making surgery a true emergency in surgical care. Why, why in pediatric surgery it's important? Because uh, the burden of pediatric surgery is very high in low income countries. And uh, a condition which can be fixed in high income countries cannot be fixed in low income countries because lack of a provider, sometimes also lack of ability to be transported from uh, the place where the child is living to the center where you could get treated. So we have a couple of issues to fix and probably we think that uh, 60 to 70% of the children around the world in low income or middle income country we need surgery, they could not get surgery. So that has to be addressed. So going that, uh, what has a solution we can offer knowing that the COVID clearly changed the way we work today. So solution, we still have to educate people. This is very important. There are too few providers in many countries to be trained, to be able to address the situation of surgical care in children. And the disparities is uh, huge. And it could affect not only the congenital anomalies and the repair of congenital anomalies, but it could affect also the trauma we should never forget that trauma in children is the first cause of death of children around the world after the age, of, around the age of five. And the trauma care, it's huge. And without training, you cannot address a trauma in a child. So we have to provide this education. Surgical, we have to look also, what would be the benefit of providing this surgery in low-income country? Of course, everybody would say it's expensive. No, it's not. It's saving money because you are saving life. You are improving social life. When you save a child with congenital defect, you improve the quality of life in the family. And the, what we call the, you know, this uh, data, the quality adjust life years, clearly demonstrate that pediatric surgery can improve and makes the ratio <laughs> cost benefits is in favor of the benefits. So we know now where we have to go. So how can we do that with COVID? Obviously, in uh, high-income countries like uh, where I'm living now in the US, uh, the COVID has a big impact in terms of business for the institution, and we have to find a way how to uh, cover this loss of money. That's one thing. But in uh, low-income and middle-income countries, it's totally different. The business is probably part of it, but also the access to surgery. So we have to improve the access to surgery and to improve communication with country. And there is something which is good in COVID. Today, we have a Zoom meeting. A year from today, we will probably not have this kind of Zoom meeting. We'll have an in-person meeting or we'll not meet at all. Now we can meet all around the world. Use these new tools. Use the new tools we can help people to get a better education. So what can we do? We can do 
Zoom meeting, and we can do a lot of things using Zoom meeting. We can do pre-screening of the patients, for example, around the world. Any doctor, any doctor, even in the remote cities, can get access with the internet to a doctor in major institution and to say, I would like to talk to you about a patient. And we can address the situation. This is the beginning of education, Zoom meeting. After, of course, we can also improve the education by the attendance to major meeting. I am a member of two major society in the US, the American Surgical Pediatric Surgeon Association and the uh, American Society of Transplant Surgeons. All these meetings are done on Zoom. And last year, we understood that the attendance is clearly different. More than 300 to 500% more attendance because it's cheap, you don't have to travel, and you can still get the the best education you can get around the world, meaning that you meet leaders, experts, and that's part of the benefit of the COVID. And I hope it will last. Now, is this will stop the in-person meeting and the training? No, unfortunately, no. We still have, we surgeons, we still have to train. Well, it's like a companionage, you know, we have to train, you know, it's like a carpenter, it's like a contractor. He has to learn his job. A surgeon has to learn his job and you cannot learn his job in one day. So maybe we have with the COVID to change the way we did healthcare in low and middle income countries, education. For many it's years we are doing for many years we are doing short mission. I think now we should do long mission. In these countries, I think we have to provide education. I think we have to check how can we work with what exists in the countries. And if it does not exist, think we should probably do something new that we did with the Chandelier Square, building some institutions, some hospital where we can clearly move forward and to move up and to provide this education. And uh, last, I would like to say, we have to focus on a few things. Provide surgery, but also verify that the quality surgical care and the provide education for the best practices. We have to keep the academic education. We have to keep the research everywhere around the world. And also don't forget, as a doctor, we are not taking care only of clinical patients, research and education, we are part of the social justice. It's absolutely unacceptable that in one country you could not get the care you deserve and in another country you could get that, even sometimes in the country. So social justice is part of it. And uh, I hope uh, with the, the United Surgeon for Children in the US will probably make this feasible with all the new tools and all the willings of people in the future. Thank you so much for that overview, Dr. Yan. I just want to follow up a bit on that because you mentioned about Zoom meetings and having these virtual gatherings. I want to know what are the um, a, what are the um, opportunities, but as well as the challenges with that, especially when we talk about training local providers in, in countries outside of the U.S. So, I think that you know, education it's uh, not only practice; it's also reading communication with other people, expert, who will give you some uh, tips, some, uh, the way they do things, you know, and also real training, I mean, to improve your skills. I think we have to work on both. Zoom cannot help for the, I would say, clinical training. You still need to do in-person. We are surgeon, so we have to do in-person training. So mission will come back as soon as the vaccine will be much more spreading around the world, mission will be important. But I think the way we did it was not perfectly well for many years. Many uh, organizations, they were doing missions, you know, taking care of patients, few days and hop, going back home. It's not the way we, we want to do that. We want to do education locally, sometimes to bring for long term people to be trained in high income countries, which is complicated with immigration issues with the COVID now, but will probably not last. And to go back, we need also the feedback to be sure everything is done. So obviously we will not stop that, but we can be prepared for these missions. And also we can screen the patient before the surgery. We can also help 
the local team for the post-operative care. And I think that now we could get access all around the world with uh, internet, you know, even in remote villages, you know, we have internet now. So it's very important. And I would not like to speak about uh, the future, but I can imagine in the 10 years from now, maybe some centers in everywhere on the world will get robotic surgery. And I can imagine with the 5G, maybe we can control the robot, you know, from, uh, I would say, uh, New York, Paris, um, uh, Lagos to another centers. And that's very important. Last point, I think I did not speak because I think we we'll talk about that is uh, we cannot say it's only in big cities like Paris, New York. No, we have to move to the south to south education. That means we have to build centers in different parts of the world with leaders who have been trained. We can be strong and talented and skilled educators. And then locally people will contribute to come to these centers to get their education. And that will make things easier with the COVID because uh, you cannot come across the world now, but you can probably go easily from one country to another country. Avoid the barons, but uh, it's okay. Uh, you can go to one country, the next door you can go. And that would be very, I think, the futures to get multi centers for training people around the world and not only a few of them in big cities. Thank you so much, Dr. Yan, for those insights. And also, you know, he talks about the future of surgery, robotic surgery is really something futuristic to, to look forward to. But also you mentioned about South-South collaboration and, and also this multi-centers, not just in the high-income countries. So thank you for so much for, for those insights. Um, you know, uh, technology, that's something that we're going to talk about more in this panel. Um, uh, well, apart from Dominic, as I mentioned earlier, we have a great set of panelists today um, who's going to share their experiences, but also models of improving local capacity for, for surgery. So let me just briefly introduce each one of them. Um, we have with us Dr. Eric Chason, president and co-founder of La Chan de l'Espoir, whose goal really is to provide better healthcare and surgery for vulnerable children around the world. Um, he is also a board member of the United Surgeons for Children. And as you can imagine, been to a lot of uh, places uh, globally doing humanitarian missions. Um, in 2018, he was awarded the Mir Masjedi Khan Medal, one of Afghanistan's highest civilian honors. Um, we also have with us Professor Najibullah Bina, um, he's a clinical professor and head of cardiac surgery at the French Medical Institute, Mothers and Children in Kabul. Uh, professor Bina started the first training program for cardiac surgeons in the history of Afghanistan and in 2008 performed the first cardiac surgical procedure with a team made up of only Afghan staff. He is currently head of the cardiac program at FMIC where up to 600 surgeries are done every year on children and adults. I just wanna make sure that Dr. Bina is, is with us. And on, can you please turn on your camera, Dr. Bina? Uh, hello. Good evening, yes, yes, definitely I'm here, yeah. <clears throat> All right, thank yeah. you very much. Um, and then we have uh, Professor Emmanuel Ame. He's a professor of pediatric surgery and shift Chief Consultant Pediatric Surgeon at the National Hospital in Abuja, Nigeria. He was formerly Professor of Surgery at the Amadou Bello University, where he started the very first mild trained cleft care program in Nigeria. His research focuses on global surgery, access to surgical care, and children's surgical care in low resource settings. Um, and then we have Mamta Carroll. Smile Train's Vice President and Regional Director for Asia. So Smile Train is actually an international children's charity providing corrective surgery for children with left lip, left lip and palate. And Mamta started with Smile Train in 2006, managing its largest program area in India, and currently manages Smile Train's programs across 19 countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the MENA region. Panelists, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So I Thank you, Jenny. Well, so I just want to start off from the conversation we just had with, with um, Dominic. I wanted to ask about your experiences, really. Um, and this question comes in two parts. What has been the biggest challenge in trying to improve people's access to surgery 
prior to COVID? And how did that change? Or if that has changed completely today? Perhaps I'm gonna ask that first question to um, Professor Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, I, I, taking off from where uh, Dominic stopped, um, we, we all have acknowledged that about 5 billion people around the world don't have access to uh, safe surgical care. But when you break that down to, to children, uh, our recent work showed that 1.7 billion children around the world actually do not have access to safe surgical care. And majority of them are in low and middle income uh, countries. And, and in, in terms of population demographics, in low and middle income countries, especially if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, about 43 to 50% of the population are children. But unfortunately, even before COVID, the healthcare system uh, does not pay particular attention to children. So already children before COVID were disadvantaged. We had huge backlog of cases that we couldn't do. When COVID came, the biggest challenge it brought for us was then that with all the lockdowns, the, the backlog of cases multiplied several times and worse of it were for children who had conditions that were progressive like cancers, they couldn't get to hospital. And that meant that by the time they actually got to us, they are now coming in very advanced uh, stage. And, and that really uh, was quite um, unfortunate. The other challenge is created for us also was the, the fact that uh, some of the children who normally had elective surgical problems but because they couldn't come to hospital ended up coming as emergencies. And the emergencies were not just simple emergencies, they were now complicated emergencies. So, so those were some of the key challenges that um, uh, COVID uh, brought for us. Uh, in addition to that, our training uh, system also was significantly impacted because we, we need our trainees to have hands-on skills, but obviously with COVID that was no longer uh, possible. So a training program that should last uh, maybe for three months now obviously has to last much, much uh, longer than that. So, so those were some of the key problems that uh, COVID uh, presented to us. Thank you so much, Professor Emmanuel. Let me turn to um, Professor Najibullah. Can you give us a sense of, of your experience in, in Afghanistan? Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So. Our ex experience is uh, a little bit uh, different because uh, Afghanistan, as uh, everyone uh, knows that we are a post-conflict country. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately. So what, uh, what is our, our um, experience, uh, especially in the French Medical uh, Institute for Children, uh, for mothers and, and children, is uh, because uh, during the war, all the infrastructures has been completely destroyed, and uh, only uh, until two, 1992, the only uh, city who has uh, who had the um, high quality um, services and and. And the health was Kabul. And unfortunately, the civil war started in 1992, 1993. To all the hospitals, all the health and infrastructures, um, pharmaceutical um, factories, everything that has been in Kabul and has been um, built uh, for the last 20 to 30 years has been completely. Uh, destroyed. And then when the Taliban came in 1996, uh, so again, the huge change has been, uh, <laughs> sorry, brought to the, to the country. And uh, of course, to the all um, things, ladies uh, and women who had the, the biggest impact on the health structure of Afghanistan, <laughs> the nurses, 
the doctors, the surgeons, and also other um, health um, providers. Unfortunately, they had to uh, stay at home. And then uh, um, uh, this was a big problem because from one side, we lost the infrastructures. From other side, we lost the huge number of staff and uh, uh, health uh, providers. So the, um, uh, once the, the, the Taliban gone in 2001, a new page uh, of the health services uh, based on the 21st uh, century. Fortunately, the French government and especially with the um, cooperation of, of uh, La Chaine de l'Espoir, um, which uh, started in 2002-2003, the first hospital has been uh, built on the minefield uh, now. I'm in French Medical Institute. So where I'm sitting right now is uh, in 2001, in 2002 was the, the, the minefield. Nobody could. Hi, Dr. Najibullah, can you hear me? You're breaking up. I think we just. Did we lost her? I think he's muted. Dr. Dajibula, are you still there? I think he's muted. Uh, Look, you know, I, I have a long habit to, to the communication with Kabul and sometimes it's very difficult because of uh, electricity power or security issue or and probably has a, a problem now. Well, I just, I, maybe I can ask you, Dr. Eric, uh, on your thoughts about, on this issue, challenges in, you know, for, for healthcare workers trying to gain access to, trying to help people gain access to, to surgeries. What are, your, what are your experience on this? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to, to be with you uh, today and, and was, uh, I, I was very interesting by the speech of uh, Dominique and uh, Emmanuel, and I'm completely agree. You know, uh, I have a, a long experience because uh, I was on the first mission of the French doctors between bracket be, be, with Bernard Kushner in the uh, China Sea to rescue the boat people and after in Biafra and uh, after the first mission in, um, in Afghanistan in 80s. But for us, the challenges have completely changed the last five years. Due to the worsening of the international situation, and in particular, the worsening of poverty in developing countries and therefore of the north-south imbalance. In our field, in a surgery field, this has been very well shown by the Lancet Commission study on global surgery published in 2015 and 2016. And it was a really a, a, a real shock for us, the Lancet Commission study on global surgery. It revealed for the first time that primary health care was not only a priority and that the surgery that we had been practicing for more than 20 years had become a key issue in the development of health in the world. Indeed, I would like to remind you that this study showed that the leading cause of mortality in developing countries is no longer tuberculosis, AIDS of malaria, but the lack of access to a surgical platform for patients. And it was very important to show this, this, this fact. Uh, this study also shows that 90% of maternal, maternal mortality could be avoided through better access to surgical trains. And it also highlights an urgent need for training of 2.2 million surgeon, anesthetic, and obstetrician worldwide. It was very important for us. And 
it completely changed the, the, the vision. The second challenge, but sorry to insist, it's the security challenge. It's a, it's a really a, a, a problem for, for USAFC and La Chaine in France or Médecins Sans Frontières or Médecins du Monde. Or... And doctors, surgeons, nurses, missionary have become a target now. And it's very important to, to, to understand this fact. And I want to tell you the drama and Najibullah, uh, I hope he, he hear me. It's an example of the attack on the maternity ward of Médecins Sans Frontières in Kabul in May 2020, which was for us the certainty that a red line has been crossed in the face of horror and human madness leading to the killing of pregnant women and babies of few words. It was really for us a red line. The security issue has created difficulty of access for European nor American doctors to developing country, but also extreme difficulty Iraq, Mali, and so on, to come to our country, which has become, become impenetrable due to a movement of withdrawal and isolationism. And it's very important. It's impossible to organize mission on the South, but it's impossible for us to come. And it's why I completely agree that the new tools, the numeric tools, Zoom webinar are probably the key for the future. And we, we try to develop all this uh, new technology and particularly artificial intelligence and telesurgery. I'm sure it's probably a tool to avoid this uh, difficulty because of security challenge and political uh, difficulties that we have in uh, the, the different places that we, we try to, to help in Africa, in Asia, in Mali, in uh, Kurdistan, in Iraq or in Iran. It's now very difficult to organize this mission. Thank you. I want to follow up on that, uh, uh, Dr. Eric, you know, can you talk about some some sustainable sustainable models that you've taken part out of you've seen uh, that sort of um, reinforce this building local capacities and, and you know supporting south south partnerships i think that uh, you know uh, I, I hope that uh, in few minutes it what is possible it, it will be possible to to discuss with uh, dr bina but probably perhaps one, perhaps one or just one, one or two, uh, Dr. Eric, so we can, you know, give others as well some uh, their chance to, to share their insight. Uh, for, for me, the best example in my long experience is the FMIC, the hospital in Kabul, because it's probably the first very huge project with almost the sustainability. Because, uh, you know, uh, if you want to make surgery, you are obliged to speak about money. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's impossible. If you don't uh, want to take money, uh, don't speak about uh, surgery in uh, developing countries. And it's why we need to have a sustainable uh, model. And in Kabul, it's almost uh, uh, sustainable before the uh, crisis uh, because of uh, COVID. It was a real drama for, for economic reason in Kabul. But before it was possible because it was a sustainable model 
with a, a, rec, a, a system of uh, uh, welfare and a recovering cost. And uh, for me, the best example is Robin Wood, to take to the rich people for the poor. And you, you have to, to develop and to, um, to share the, this, uh, this model. And uh, we, we, we have a gate for the very poor people in Kabul, for the, the poorest, and they pay nothing on the pre, pair, and post-operative period. And you have a, a place, uh, another gate for uh, the rich or something who, who can pay something. And it's very important, uh, and it's why it's very difficult to, to find organization who want to uh, develop surgery or to be in charge on a, on a hospital. Because um, if you, you take in charge uh, an hospital, it's a, a very, very difficult uh, model to, to develop. And, and perhaps it's possible to, to ask to, to, to Najib to develop because he, he works in this uh, hospital. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric. But let me just uh, pull in uh, Mamza. Mamza, you, your work at Smile Train, can you perhaps talk us, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, model? Hi, again, sorry, can you I hear me? Jenny, you're mute, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm just putting in you, Mamta, and if you can talk about the model that you have with Smile Train and, and how you're building, you know, local capacity as well. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you, DevEx, for inviting us, and thank you, my um, esteemed panelists who shared the experience. It's been uh, wonderful listening to all of you. And um, as Dr. Eric said, and Dr. Amea and Dr. Dominique, that uh, we are talking about building local capacity and you know reaching out to those uh, poorest of the poor uh, in these uh, you know developing countries and uh, developed world, world where uh, there are millions of children waiting to be helped and that's basically the model of smile train when smile train was created it was formed and it was basically to cater to these uh, you know uh, needs of these poor children and um, the the main um, point of uh, the main focus of the organization is sustainability, as Dr. Eric said, and uh, building a local capacity and empowering local, uh, local doctors. So we are a model which only works with local doctors, um, you, not only just you know, helping them uh, with the funding for surgery, for complete comprehensive care, whether it's nutrition, it's speech therapy or orthodontics, but also training. So we are a very training focused organization, uh, which basically, and uh, as everyone uh, talked about training of surgeons, we go beyond that. So it is training for the anesthetists, a training for nurses, training for technicians. So training at every level, because we all know that in, in countries that, you know, kind of we work with and Smiltin works in almost uh, more than 85 countries around the globe. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the training is required for everyone. So the training is required basically for the first responders or the immediate caregivers of, uh, you know, uh, pediatric surgery. And we, we basically focusing on clefts and therefore it is so very important that all of the teams who actually deliver the cleft care are all trained and are, they have the know-how and they have the capability and capacity to actually take this forward. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that is what we really focus on. I want to follow up on just that because most of the time we see, yeah. you know, um, experts from high income countries going to you know, low income countries. True. Do we have models in place where we see, you know, low or middle income going to another low middle income country to do this kinds of, of uh, building local capacity to build these trainings? What models do we have in place today? Right. So, um, we have seen uh, these mission models earlier and, and you know, we do have experience um, of uh, seeing them, whether it's in India or say in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or you know, other countries where it's required. But the model which really works is the one which works with building the local capacity because ultimately 
these are the people, these are the teams who really need to take care. As um, you know, I, I think Dr. Dominique said that, uh, you know, especially in pediatric surgery, when the child needs multiple interventions or, you know, really, uh, you know, that kind of close care, you can't just have a model which, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the mission group goes, he does, he, uh, they do the surgery and they, they just come back to their own countries. This, the consistency should be there. The continuity should be there. And when we are talking about comprehensive cleft care, we're not talking about just one treatment. This could be five or six, or, you know, multiple interventions. It could be speech therapy. It could be orthodontics. And therefore a consistent uh, long drawn treatment or consistent hand holding is required. And therefore the only model which will work is, is the smile train model, which only works with local doctors. And what is required? We need to address those gaps. Yes, there are there are tremendous gaps. There are gaps whether uh, there are gaps in providing that funding, whether there are gaps in providing the training, or you know something else, or capacity building, or equipping them if there are you know not enough equipment available or whatever. So one, we need to understand those. We need to understand what those gaps are, and then we need to garner the support for them, and garner the support in such a way that ultimately it's sustainability that you're working towards that someday organizations like you know when smile train is uh, no longer there or some other funding organization is no longer there how do these local teams build their own program they should be trained enough to offer training to other countries for example that's the goal of smile train that's the goal of empowering people with the know-how so that ultimately it's their program they have to take ownership of that Unless and until we don't have ownership, we cannot, you know, we cannot take these kind of programs forward. Thank you, Mons. I just want to pull in perhaps uh, Professor Emmanuel. Can you talk about, uh, you know, South South partnerships? Have you been involved in one? Have you been, you know, you know, taken part in one? Have seen models that work uh, uh, in your experience? Yes. Thank you, Jenny. I, I think that such. Um, a very important aspect of building uh, capacity in low and middle income countries. But in terms of what I've been involved with, uh, the West African College of Surgeons has been involved in training surgeons across all specialties for more than 30 years. And it's entirely a collaboration between several countries in West Africa, both Francophone and Anglophone uh, countries. And why it has been successful is that it's Everybody owns it, everybody participates in it, and, and it, it leverages the, the strength of the local surgeons uh, that we have. And to give you an example, um, about 15, 20 years ago, we had less than 50 pediatric surgeons in Nigeria. But through the training programs of the West African College of Surgeons, we now have more than 100 pediatric surgeons in Nigeria. So, so that model has been very successful. It's entirely a South-South collaboration. Um, of course, we do need our support from time to time. And I must bring in Smile Train here. So, so recently, Smile Train came to the West African College of Surgeons and said, look, how do we help strengthen uh, your capacity building program? And with the, with the college, they created uh, an advanced cleft care training uh, fellowship, which now takes cleft care to a higher level between be, beyond what uh, the basic level was. And I think that's, that's so important regarding what um, uh, developmental partners can do. And, and recently also we realized that um, we needed to bring together all children's surgery stakeholders across the world mostly low and middle income countries, and we created a global initiative for children's surgery. So this is entirely um, a collaboration between LMIC uh, children's surgery providers with support from HICs. And it has been very successful because we can now exchange uh, trainings, exchange ideas, including building capacity and also building uh, research uh, capacity. But I must emphasize that Yes, we have to train, but we, 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 as Dominic pointed out earlier on, there's a huge infrastructure gap. So there's no point you've trained pediatric surgeons and they really don't have the infrastructure to provide the care 
that they have been trained to provide. So, so I think in terms of infrastructure, that's an area that we need a significant investment to support the capacity building efforts of the South-South collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Emmanuel. You, you, you talked about infrastructure and funding, and we're gonna get, get there later on, but I just wanna ask about how do we scale up these kinds of models? Perhaps Professor Najibullah, um, you know, you've performed the first Karjak surgical procedure uh, with a team made up of only Afghan staff in Kabul. I wonder how we how we can scale that 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 up in, in a lot of these low and middle income countries. Uh, sorry, Jenny, I, I just uh, cut. I, I didn't get your last words. Sorry. Yes, I just want to want want to know how how can we you know, do the same in other countries? How can we scale? How, how can you have that same experience with other countries where, you know, local doctors, uh, local health workers are the ones who are really leading <laughs> on the front yeah. here? Mm -hmm. Actually, again, uh, I am uh, emphasizing that, uh, um, you know, the first approach, the first approach, especially by the experts already, um, it's, it's very, very, very important. What La Chaine de l'Espoir did in, in Kabul. So um, they built uh, first the, the hospital and then they created the supportive services around uh, the cardiac surgery before uh, performing the, the open heart surgery. So for nearly a year or so, we had the cardiology department, we had the pediatric department, we had uh, the general surgery, pediatric surgery department, we had, uh, we developed the dental clinic, we, we developed the uh, ENT, and then we, we created um, the anesthesia team, and then the ICU team, and everything. And then finally, when there were supportive services around the, the um, uh, cardiac surgery department, so that's then, with the experts from uh, from France, and not only from France, but from Germany, and also from uh, from uh, England, as well as the um, Belgium. So the first experts in each area uh, came and stayed between two to three or to four weeks with the local staff. Um, for example, surgeon for with surgeons, uh, anesthesia with anesthetists, and all also cardiology team, and as well the perfusionist and I, OT nurses, anesthesia nurses, ICU nurses, uh, as well as even the nutritionist and the physiotherapist. So that's the way that the first um, one week or so, so the experts, um, I mean, the, the, they were doing the things and then the, our uh, staff were, uh, were participating, but not really, they were only the um, bedside training and slowly, slowly, that's the capacity building went uh, to 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 get over to the to the team, and then for nearly one, we always had someone with us um, to um, to monitor us and also to help us um, to go um, further, and that's why we we could uh, build uh, the team. And uh, we could operate uh, the first uh, open heart surgery with um, all Afghan teams. And uh, since then, of course, there should be always, always um, uh, um, conventions between the, the different services. Uh, and for example, now every uh, Wednesday we have a um, um, e consultation with the ECO at uh, one of um, experts uh, in cardiology, pediatric cardiology in Paris, and also in the same room with another um, pediatric surgeon uh, and also pediatric cardiac surgeon in Paris. So we are discussing the the um, uh, the cases. They know us and we know them. So because we work together during so many years, so um, after five ten minute discussion. We reach the, the 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 conclusion how to approach the patient, do the surgery, not to do surgery, do the corrective surgery, or do the palliative surgery, or or whatever. Um, I think this is this is the, the experience that that uh, that we had, and and it really really works. Thank you, Professor Najibullah. Um, I 
we have a question actually, so I'm just gonna throw that in for, for Mamta. Um, you mentioned about empowering local communities to prepare them once Smile Train leaves the area. Um, I'm curious to know how that exit strategy looks like. Yeah, it's basically uh, about, as I said, the training and capacity building of uh, you know, the local medical professionals to take ownership of the programs and to deliver that world-class care that Smile Train offers. It's basically uh, you know, empowering all of them and filling in the gaps, whether it is infrastructure, whether it's training, whether it's you know, in other areas. And, and therefore, a, a community, as long as, yes, there are clefts, Yes, definitely, we will, uh, we will be there. Smile Train has a long-term commitment to help in those areas. But it has to be a partnership with the local communities. It has to be a partnership. I'm talking about a partnership where both of them, there, there is some amount of work which is required from the partner hospital itself. And then there is Smile Train as a funding agency. And when these two agencies come together, that's when a winning model works. And that is what we are here to talk about. So uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, that uh, there, there are two, two sides of a great partnership, whether it's a local hospital and Smile Train, and when both of them work together. And when, you know, if the, uh, there is a capacity where there is more training that people can offer, and then they go out in the other countries to train, definitely a Smile Train will, is, the resources are available to other countries as well. So that's what the model of Smile Train is. Thank you, Mamta. Um, I want to ask about, you know, the elephant in the room and, and want to talk about funding, you know. Um, Dr. Eric earlier said, you know, you can't even start talking about surgery when, when you don't even have money. Um, Dr. Emmanuel, you know, talked about um, it, even though you, you, it's not just about training, you have to have the infrastructure in place and, you know, you also need, you know, funding for that. I wanted to ask everyone, uh, all our panelists perhaps, um, what kind of funding support is needed today and where should they be directed um, on how, so we can really um, boost access to surgeries for in a lot of low and middle income countries? Um, Mamta, perhaps you, you wanna start? Uh, it's very important to you know, to speak money. Okay, and, that's very, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we need a lot funding, funding for what? To build to equip and also the maintenance. And I am completely focused on maintenance and bio, uh, biomedical services. It's the key for the success. If you have no biomedical services in maintenance, uh, you have to avoid uh, such project. And um, we know how it's difficult not to build, not to equip, but to run an hospital to provide the consumable, the, the medicine, the prosthesis, and so on. And it, it's why it's a very, very huge uh, challenge. And uh, it's why we, we, we need to have a, a collective and a global strategy to find uh, uh, money. I, I'm sure it's why uh, La Chaine uh, want to, to create and to develop USFC because we, we have to be completely transparent. You know that for Médecins Sans Frontières, sorry, uh, Doctor Without Border, you know the French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, who you say, <laughs> Doctor Without Brother. Uh, Médecins Sans Frontières um, has uh, about 60% from their huge budget from USA. And it's very important to have this partnership with uh, USA because of money, but also for uh, medical uh, human resources. We need really to find money, but also medical uh, human resources, because it's very difficult now in France, but also in Europe, 
to find uh, medical skills because there is a real problem in France. Uh, you know, there is, we have not enough anesthesiologist or a surgeon uh, in our hospital. It, it's the same in UK and, uh, or in, in Germany. And it's why it, it's very, uh, very important to, to, uh, to develop uh, this strategy. And uh, I, uh, I remember my last visit to Liberia. Uh, to, in Moravia. It was one year and a half ago. I discovered the, the, the UGFK hospital in a dramatic state, totally unusable, totally destroyed by the war and after by uh, Ebola situation. And I have the project. I have a long discussion with the, the, the extraordinary uh, surgeon who makes the cover of times. But I need money for that. Or it's a only promise. I know I have uh, the project with uh, the operating room with uh, uh, eight beds uh, for ICU, sterilization, and so on. It's a complex package. It's impossible for me to find money for Liberia in France or in Europe. It's impossible. Uh, it, it, it will be interesting to, to, to say mm -hmm. why, but it, it's the case. It's not in the, pre, uh, the priority of uh, uh, France or uh, Europe, but the real need, a real need for uh, pediatric surgery. And thank, thank you, Dr. Mind. Eric. Um, I just want to pull in as well, Dr. Um, Najib Bula. Um, if, if you know, uh, being on the ground, really knowing the challenges in, in Afghanistan, I wanted to hear his thoughts as well in terms of, um, you know, if, if you have the money right now, perhaps a billion dollars, and that's that's a lot. But where would you? Where do you think? Where would you? You know, direct that money at the moment to improve access to surgical care in Afghanistan? Yeah, it's, it's very uh, interesting uh, question. Thank you, Jenny. But uh, first, I, I just to add uh, something uh, about uh, what's important. Uh, you know, to to to. Um, Build the access for the for the surgery. I think from one from our experience, uh, the most important thing is to to um, uh, to find the the connection with the government with the local government. It's it's very 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 important to to have the government uh, in your side. Secondly, you have to have the civil society and of course the local community around you to support. To support you, that's why you can build the, the project, and then the project will be um, really successful. Um, and uh, about your question, if I have a billion um, dollar uh, right now, how how I will uh, will um, make it uh, to you know the access of, for the surgery? I think, uh, unfortunately, for the years and because uh, of the war. All the facilities now, you know, uh, concentrated in, in Kabul and also in big cities. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, you know, lots of, you know, um, basic, um, uh, you know, health centers um, has been messed in, in very um, um, uh, remote areas and the villages or, or other. So what I will do, I, I think I will put uh, Half of this money on the basic health services to first to to find to diag uh, to to find the patients to do the diagnostic on the on the place and then I will put half of this money in the four different provinces in the north of Afghanistan, south of Afghanistan, east and uh, west of Afghanistan, and then I will build the all capacities the surgical um, not you know the tertiary care. Um, um, surgery for yes. the 
for the kids. Uh, probably I will keep still the in tertiary care um, uh, um, hospitals Thank and, and very, you know, two or three provinces. Afghanistan. Thank you, but Dr. I will, Najibila. I will do the, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to just get perhaps a minute to Dr. Um, Emmanuel and Mamsa as well to give them a chance to to let us know if they have this a billion dollars, where would they, where would they, how would they spend that to increase, uh, improve access to surgery? Uh, very, very briefly, perhaps, Dr. Emmanuel. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Two things I will do very quickly. I will build a children's, create a children's hospital, which doesn't exist in Nigeria at the moment for a population of more than 200 million people. That will make it possible for me to begin to train all the children surgery providers, including nursing across all the specialties. And second thing I will do is to, to find a way to begin to expand access to surgical care at district hospital level to be able to take care of very basic surgical problems. So those are the two things I will invest the money in. Thank you so much, Professor Emmanuel. And Mamta, very, very quickly, perhaps? Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely infrastructure in, in the countries that we work. And uh, we're not going to obviously single out all the countries. Definitely it's South South and uh, the you know, 85 countries that we work in. And uh, training, I think um, a state of the art uh, training uh, university or a surgery university or whatever you may call it. And uh, definitely a lot of investment in training is just not the, uh, the doctors in terms of the surgeons and the anesthetists, but I would really go down to the entire healthcare system for training. Thank you so much, Mamta. Thank you so much to all our panelists, to, to Dr. Eric, Emmanuel, um, Dr. Najibula, uh, Dr. Jan earlier, and Mamta for all of these insights. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. Um, it's been a really great discussion, and, and I hope you, you, we have more. But um, I wanted to thank everyone um, again, and also our partner, the United Surgeons for Children, and have everyone to tune in to this important conversation. Again, I just want to remind you that if you have an opportunity to meet and greet with our speakers and perhaps ask your additional questions um, uh, in, in the, in the, at dvx.cm slash USFC. You can see the link as well in our chat, um, so it's easier for you. Again, thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Well, I don't know. Eric? Eric, tu m'entends? Très bien. Bon, ça va? Oui. Bon, ça va. Je pense que si tu veux, en termes de budget, en termes de budget euh, un truc qui peut être très intéressant, c'est des...